What's up, everybody? Brett Okamoto from ESPN, joined with uh, Mark Ramondi, who has been uh, my colleague for many years now. But uh, 20, 2022 is the year that we are here to talk about today, Mark. Um, so we'll be looking back at the uh, some of the biggest storylines, some of the biggest breakthrough performances, fights of the year, all that good stuff that we always talk about at the end of the uh, at the end of every year. But before we get into it, my guy, how you doing? How is uh, it's a little bit of a lull here on the schedule. So how are you trying to fill up uh, your time with no fights to cover? Doesn't feel like a lull, Brett. Uh, the holidays are coming up very fast, and uh, there is still quite a bit to do um, before the holiday season uh, engulfs us. It's, it's also like the only off season that we get, right? As MMA reporters, uh, there's really no off season in sports, so we have a few weeks in between fights, which is good. But it doesn't mean the work stops. Uh, I will actually be on my way to Tokyo, Japan, in a few days to cover the Bellator versus Ryzen fight. Have a an article coming out. Uh, after Christmas about the traditional Japanese combat sports event on New Year's Eve every year, going back to 2000. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Got to get that done before I leave though, Brett. And that is, uh, that is the challenge. Yeah. Well, yeah, well uh, you're filling up your time, even though there, uh, there aren't too many events on the schedule. I don't know if I'm jealous or I'm great. I'm grateful that I'm not going to Japan. It sounds like a great time, but the actual art of or the logistics of getting out there and then covering the event um, I don't know. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be chilling here at my parents' house in Colorado. So, uh, uh, pros and cons to, to both, both of the ways that we're spending our end of the year, but let's, uh, without further ado, let's get into 2022. It was an interesting year. Um, you know, no Conor McGregor fights. Yeah. Francis Ngannou fought once, uh, at the start of the year. And you know, that that's been kind of an ongoing storyline. Um, a lot of different things, obviously that we can talk about. Let's, let's start with, in your opinion, the biggest storyline that came out of 2022. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it was a really strange year. Uh, there were some results that were uh, that were odd and that didn't go as expected. And I, I think the storyline, the biggest storyline of the year to me was kind of the dethroning of several of the dominant champions in the UFC. And uh, I'll throw Charles Oliveira in there, too. He wasn't a long term champion, but he was also like a, one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world. And he lost in the first he got you know finished in the first round by Islam Makacha back in October. Uh, rewind to uh, August where uh, Kamar Usman had, you know, he was cruising in that fight against Leon Edwards. Fifth round, crack, head kick, boom, finished. New champion, no longer pound for pound king, Kamar Usman. Uh, Leon Edwards is, is now the man at welterweight. Fast forward to November, MSG, Israel Adesanya winning that fight, fantastic fight against Alex Pereira, that storyline, that the 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 incredible uh you know history between those two guys. Alex Pereira gets him in the fifth round, finishes him, new middleweight champion. So three of the top pound for pound fighters in the world lost their titles, got finished, and lost their mantle, I guess, as as pound for pound kings, all in the span of four months this year. To me, that was probably the biggest story of the year. Uh Honorable mention, and I think it'll be a bigger story next year, will be this this betting scandal that's going on mm -hmm. right now that's being investigated that involves uh, uh, James Krause, Derek Minner. Um, that, that's probably going to be the big story of next year, I would imagine. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I think you're right. I think that uh, there's sort of the changing of the guard. And I think that there's a – I mean, there are some names that you didn't even mention there that you could kind of add. I mean, you hit all the obvious ones, but you could almost kind of add Piotr Jan because even though Aljamain was yeah. the champion, everybody looked at Jan as the champion, and then Aljo beat him in the rematch, and then Aljo beat TJ Dillashaw. So Also, I Kayla think, Harrison, uh, too. Kayla Harrison losing to Larissa Pacheco just two weeks after Adesanya lost. Exactly right. So uh, that was my other one. That was going to be my other one was potentially even the biggest uh, one of the biggest storylines of the year. Not that it necessarily felt that everybody was was crazy paying attention to Kayla's last run through the PFL. I mean, that was the third time she was going to do it. Yeah. But I think her losing. I mean, you go back to the the end of 2021 and Amanda lost. And now you go back mm -hmm. to the end of this year and now Kayla has lost. What does that do? Obviously, the PFL had a lot of different plans for her. The UFC had had some interest in Kayla. Um you know, trying to, to maybe see if there was something that they could do with Kayla or just that loss. How does that, what impact does that have on, on all of those potential plans that PFL and even potentially the UFC may have had for her down the road. Um, and I thought Francis and Ghanu still it, going into the year, I thought that was going to be maybe the biggest story, but then it kind of just, 
ground to a hold with his whole injury. I think going into 2023, watch our, our, uh, our preview of 2023. I think that that's going to be one of my top stories going. And, and it's crazy. Cause I'm pretty sure when we did this last year, I said that Francis and gone, was going to be the main story to keep an eye on in 2022, but I didn't know at that time that his knee was injured and that, uh, he basically would just kind of be chilling all of 2022. Okay. So we talked about the big storylines. Let's talk about a breakthrough fighter of the year. I've obviously got a few on my list. It's not an easy thing, I don't think, necessarily, oh. to pick a breakthrough fighter of the year. I think that there's a lot of different candidates. Ultimately, which way did you go? Yeah, I mean, that's a hard one because it's uh, – what does that mean exactly? Is that someone who, you know, took things to a new level? Is that someone that kind of burst onto the scene? So there's a, so there were so many interesting names this year from, like, the Bo Nichols and the, the Raul Rosas Juniors of the world, even to, like, you know, a Yasmin Haregi, someone like that. A Jack uh, Della Maddalena had a really good year. But I think – if you want to say breakthrough fighter, uh, I, I'm not saying it's someone uh, who, who was a rookie to the UFC. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Marlon Chito Vera, and I know mm-hmm. that, and, and I know that he had a big win, of course, in November 2021 against Frankie Edgar, a huge knockout. But you know, to go into San Diego and knock out Dominic Cruz the way that he did uh, back in August, and 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 it wasn't just the results of the fight either, Brett. I feel like there is a lot of buzz right now around Chito Vera. I feel like he has taken his star power his brand to the next level and i feel like he is someone that people are really going to be watching a lot in 2023 but i just feel like if you, if you want to say one guy who maybe took themselves to a new level who was already maybe a little bit established i feel like cheeto vera is a big star going into next year yeah yeah i, I don't disagree and i think he's right there with my name I, neck and neck I, i'm gonna say sean o'malley which which feels like an obvious pick and yeah. and he was very popular coming into this year and, and obviously he's still popular go, coming out of it but i think that the strides that he made and i bet if you sat down and talked to him some of the business strides that he made some of the um it, even away from the octagon some of the things that he did and then you know to think about the way we were talking about o'malley coming into this year like hey is this guy just a can crusher is he all hype you know and then he had that little break into the top 10 moment with pedro munoz which was a weird moment but, you know, it happened the way it happened. And then he got the big one, Fyodor Jan. And whether you thought he won that fight or not, um, he, he still got all the respect from everybody. Like even people out there who are saying he didn't win that fight are saying, no, Sean O'Malley is the real deal. So I think that when you just talk about uh, the performances, the different way that, that he's looked at from a competitive standpoint, but also as a brand, I think O'Malley probably made the biggest strides of, of, of anybody um, that comes to my mind in uh in the sport in 2022 let's talk about someone that we're gonna miss this was a big year for retirements man and uh i I gotta say some of them hit me kind of hard they probably hit you kind of hard too because we're kind of at that point in our careers where you know we came in and yes i I saw chuck liddell retire i saw tito ortiz retire i saw chael sonnen retire you know and and those hit me all hard but i was not those were not ones that i kind of started my career with Um, i'm just going to throw mine right off the bat the first fight i ever covered for espn was frankie edgar versus gray maynard too and that to this day is my favorite fight of all time um, because of the way Frankie survived at that at that point, you know, we, when we were talking about, oh, does a 10 seven round exist in the way that Frankie got knocked down, you know, three times in that. And and uh, Gray was a Vegas guy. I was a Vegas guy. So I knew Gray really well. And I just had like a personal type of um, a personal connection to that fight. And uh, and then as the years progressed, man, I mean, I just I don't know how you can love any fighter as much as you love Frankie Edgar, man. I mean, the guy just did it all classy. He did it right. He, earlier in his career, you know, he was the guy who just refused to go down and wait because he was like, no, man, I can hang with the big guys. And you loved him for that. Um, he always handled loss well, um, just well-spoken, just class. Cl- Frankie Edgar, the way he, he ran to the octagon, I just loved everything about him. So um, I, I, I don't mind saying that uh, over the course of my career, Edgar was my favorite guy to cover. Um, so obviously when I look at back on 2022 and look at the guy that, that retired that I, I will miss the most and I'll miss covering his career for me, it's Frankie Edgar. How about you? Yeah. I mean, I, I hate to, I hate to, uh, copy you on this one, Brett, but if you, if you're asking me, uh, you know, who, who the guy that I'm going to, you know, miss the most or who kind of, you know, resonates with me the most who, who retired in 2022, it, it, it's Frankie Edgar, you know, Cowboy Cerrone, of course, is a guy that I really uh, always enjoyed watching. Uh, but Frankie Yeager, and I've talked to you about this. We, talk, we talked about this in New York before his final fight against Chris Gutierrez just uh, you know, a few weeks ago, really, at MSG. Before I became an MMA reporter, I was an MMA fan, obviously, like a lot of us were. And my favorite fighter was Frankie Edgar. And it was he was just someone who, like you said, was always undersized. Uh, you know, I'm from New York. He's from New Jersey. I also may not be the 
biggest guy in the world. So I think there was maybe some that kind of just resonated with me a little bit. The fact that he was a smaller guy doing this against, you know, giant 155ers like Gray Maynard and just his toughness, just his grittiness and just and just class, just always class. You know, wh- who has a bad word to say about Frankie Edgar? I mean, if you if you're mm-hmm. saying bad things about Frankie Edgar, that might, that's probably on you, man. That's not going to be on Frankie. So, I, yeah, I mean, that's the guy for me. Wish it happened differently. You know, didn't love the way that he went out. But I know that is the business, you know, that that's kind of what happens. The young lions kind of, uh, you know, eat the uh, eat the guys going, um, you know, on the way out. But yeah, Edgar, all class, gritty, great personality, great interview, uh, just a good guy, family man. I mean, just one of the best guys in the sport. And it, it sucks to, to, to see him uh, step away, but hope he enjoys his retirement. And uh, so he was doing a little bit of pro wrestling, uh, Brett, on Instagram. That, that was fun. Yeah, the, the the one thing that Frank Edgar could do that would actually lower my opinion on him is get into <laughs> pro, uh, pro wrestling and start talking about pro wrestling. And, I, and then I also remember back in the day that uh, for a while, Frank Edgar was the guy that everybody looked at as like Connor ducked him, you know, which I thought was another oh, yeah. kind of Absolutely. another interesting part of his another chapter of his career, you know, where the UFC tried to keep Edgar and his wrestling away from from Conor McGregor. Yeah. Um, there's another interesting chapter in his career. OK, so we talked about uh, some breakthrough fighters and a uh, fighter that we will miss. Let's talk about some fights. Um, yeah. best best fight of the year what would you say yeah we have actually already discussed this off uh off camera a little bit and uh i kind of know what you're going to say already and mine is going to be different and uh the 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 glover to share a yuri for Hoska fight from june from singapore okay was it was it the most technically sound fight no was it uh you know the cleanest fight where you know no one made mistakes and it was just a, a perfect fight no but for the twists, the turns, the momentum shifts, the near finishes, you know, submissions that almost came about, knockouts that almost came about, to the end of the fight, the fifth round where Glover Teixeira had, you know, Yuri dead to rights. He was beating him up, goes for the guillotine, slips off. Yuri gets his back and chokes Glover out without even getting the hooks in. I mean, it was just an absolutely wild fight. To me, minute for minute, as dramatic as almost any fight I've ever seen, I, I would put it up there with, you know, the the Jones Gustafsons and the Lawler McDonald's. I'd put it right up there in that in that class, that elite class. I just thought it was just an absolute epic to watch so because of the the drama and the back and forth. I just thought it was a uh, just a, a hell of an entertaining fight. For sure. Uh, I am in the minority. I didn't appreciate that fight as much as everybody else. Uh, I, I agreed with what Anthony Smith said. I forget. He may have said yeah. it on the MMA hour or, or, or on one of the ESPN platforms that he's on. But he was like, I thought it was sloppy. I thought they both fought really poorly. And I, I agreed. You know, I thought it was a great fight because they both made a ton of mistakes, you know, and, and then that's what led to all the momentum. And that um, I think both of them would probably agree with me on that. Looking back on that fight, that they would both say, oh, I should have done this. I should have done this. So um, I have a little bit of a different opinion of that fight. But of course, it was it was a tremendous fight just in terms of the entertainment and the back and forth. Um, I mean, it, it's real hard for me. I, I, I think uh, just just based on moments and back and forth, I thought Shemaya Burns was fantastic. I thought that uh, it was one of those situations where you got the guy in Shemaya who thinks he's just supposed to walk in there and breathe on people and they're going to fall over and Gilbert didn't fall over. And then, and then Hamza had to learn from that, you know, and you got Andreas Michael in the corner screaming at him, like, be smart, be smart, you know? And it's just like, like this guy has the advantage. You can see he has a physical advantage over, over Gilbert, but he he's just, He's learning something right there in the moment of like, hey, man, when you get up to the top of the division, these guys are not just going to fall over when you hit them one time. So I loved that fight. But I actually got to go with Alex Pajeda and, and, and Israel Adesanya. And I know that I'm also in the minority there because they didn't even win fight of the night on that card. Chandler and Poirier did. But I just thought based on what what those two had, what they brought to the table, the adjustments that they made and just you could see just the tiniest little momentum swings and the tiniest little mistake would cost so much in that fight. I mean, Izzy almost almost knocked him out in the very first round. Then he turned to his wrestling. It wasn't the cleanest wrestling we've ever seen, but that's to, that's to be expected. He was he was trying to do something in a kickboxing fight, basically, um, to put the odds in his favor. And and he going into the fifth round, he's up, and then Pajeda gets it done in his like seventh professional MMA fight. I just thought that that was incredible. I'll never forget. I'll never forget that fight. I'll never forget uh, any of the next two we'll talk about too. And uh, we'll try to keep this brief because I know we've, I'm kind of been ranting here about these, these great fights. But knockout of the year, for me, it comes down to two, two options. Um, yeah. How about you? I think that there's really, really, there's only two answers that could be correct. But maybe I'm, I'm also in the minority on that. But I, I want to hear what you have to say. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I know which ones you're talking about, but the one that stands out to me because of just everything surrounding it is Leon Edwards, of course, knocking out Kamara Usman, fifth yeah. round. I mean, Usman is, is we talked about this at the, at the top, cruising in that fight, right? Look, I'll take people kind of, you know, uh, I'll break down the fourth wall a little bit, Brett. You know, when when we're when we're covering fights, you know, we're writing things in advance, right? You know, we're writing, we're cage side, the crowd is going crazy. You can't just, you know, write 500 words as soon as the fight is over. You have to write some things. You have to pre-write some things. And when it's a fight like that, that seems at that point one-sided. Usman is, you know, he's kind of doing his thing against Edwards. Like he has been for years. I'm writing. I'm writing that. I'm writing about Usman. And then all of a sudden, crack, head kick. It's over. Usman is out. He's unconscious. He loses the title. He loses his pound for pound uh, uh, king mantle. And dude was about to win his 16th straight UFC fight to tie mm-hmm. Anderson Silva's record. And all of that is down the drain, courtesy of a beautiful Leon Edwards head kick with less than a minute left in the fifth round of a title fight. I mean, the stakes couldn't have been higher. It was it was a, a sick technique. On the biggest stage, to me, one of the best knockouts of all time. It has to be Edwards for me. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, on the short list of like best knockouts of all time, like uh, Yair's el- back elbow of Korean yeah. Zombie is hard to beat, in my opinion, just yeah. because it was in the final second of a five round fight that he was losing. It was on it was on the uh, the twenty fifth anniversary card. <laughs> And I mean, he just, and the shot, just the shot itself. I mean, talk about a perfect storm of, of yeah. a perfect knockout. And he was losing, um, he was losing that fight. And too. he was losing. He would have lost the fight. He was one second away from losing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when you, when you take everything combined into it, I agree with you. It was one of the best knockouts of all time. How about a uh, best submission of the year? Oh, by the way, the other one, the other one that was on the short list, because I said it was between two options. Yeah, yeah, clearly, yeah. Was, clearly was Michael Chandler's front kick up the middle that apparently he's never trained before of Tony Ferguson. Um, that one was jaw dropping, but yeah, I think the, I don't, the, uh, I, don't the actually, Edwards... I don't actually believe that though. I don't think that's true. You think that's true? Michael Chandler doesn't lie, bro. Michael Chandler is too pure to lie. He is pretty pure. That's true. All right, fine. <laughs> How about submission of the year? What do you got? That was a tough one. I mean, there was uh, you know, when we talk about the knockout of the year, we talk about a lot of fights that have, that had very high stakes and, uh, there weren't so many like high stakes submissions we mentioned the Yuri Prohaska over Glover to share a finish where that was really not a great submission, right? It was more like Glover was out of gas and Yuri just grabbed his neck and, you know, squeezed. Uh, it's, a, it's a really tough one. I mean, maybe Paul Craig and Nikita Krylov, the Jessica Andrade standing arm bar over Amanda Lemos is a really good mm-hmm. one, but there wasn't a lot that stood out to me at the highest level of the, of the UFC. Yeah, no, I agree. This was, yeah. this one wasn't one of those crazy ones where it, where it just comes to your mind immediately. I, I gave it to uh, Oliver and Gaethje, again because of the circumstances. One, yeah. I mean, the guy the guy lost his belt on the scale, and then and then came out in a fight that yep. like we thought was going to be really close. It was in the it was in Gaethje's hometown, essentially, you know, in, down there in Arizona, and then he clips him and he and he and he submits him, and that was when the sport really started celebrating Charles in a, in a, as a champion more yep. than it ever had, and he wasn't even a champion anymore. Yeah. So I, it was it, just the circumstances of that made it submission of the year for me. Okay, how about male and female fighter of the year? Where 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 was your thinking on that, and where did you end up? So for me, Alex P- Alex Pereira is is the male fighter of the year. Uh, this guy came somewhat not out of nowhere, but as far as his MMA career goes, you mentioned dude has less than ten pro fights. Comes in this year, uh, you know, gets a win early, then goes out and and just absolutely decimates Sean Strickland, who's like a he's a top five level middleweight, and Alex Pereira just walks through this guy, just smokes him, uh, in, in the first round, you know, in in a few seconds. Um, and then, and then for his, uh, you know, his, his encore act, he knocks out Israel Adesanya, who by the way, had never, ever lost that middleweight before in his entire career was the long-term middleweight champion. One of the best pound pound fighters in the world. To me, it's, it's, it's Pereira. I know that there are some other good candidates. Uh, you know, the best fighter in the world this year was Alexander Volkanovsky, but did he have the best year? No, I, I would say that would be Alex Pereira. <clears throat> Uh, completely agree. I don't think it's even close. Uh, what Alex Beherta did, especially in like everything you outlined, where he where he started the year and then when he finished the year, and um, you know the fact that he had beaten Izzy twice before, but that doesn't change the fact that Izzy was being talked about as perhaps the best middleweight of all time. Like this dude was about to was about to or had eclipsed Anderson Silva in the minds of many people, and that's the guy Beherta goes out and knocks out in the fifth round. 
unfreaking believable year by Alex Pedera. And then uh, female fighter of the year for you. Zhang Weili. Uh, I would say Zhang Weili. Uh, there weren't a ton of amazing contenders, if we're, if we're being honest, but I think that uh, Zhang did the most with what she was given, and that's a spectacular fight and knockout of Joanna Jacek, and then, of course, winning the title at MSG, winning back the title at MSG against Carla Esparza. 2-0, two, two finishes, uh, wins the title. I think it has to be her this year. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, so that's our recap of 2022. Real quick, before we uh, before we wrap this thing up, because you and I actually had an interesting conversation about this off camera. Um, was it a good year in mixed martial arts? And yeah. I got to be honest, I don't think it was. Um, and that's all relative, right? I mean, yeah. at the same time, I could say that I left UFC pay-per-views on a monthly basis and said, this sport is, is so crazy, man. I yeah. just can't believe that this sport is ha- like, like, yeah. like down there in Phoenix, what happened to Charles Oliveira. And then what he did against Justin Gaethje and like Michael Chandler's knockout of Tony Ferguson and some of just the back and forth fights that we saw, of course, Singapore, like you said, it, it, great action all year, but it's all relative speaking, you know, and we can't sit here and talk about years in which, you know, Conor McGregor fights three times and the sports on fire and it's, uh, you know, breaking into the mainstream every two seconds, you, you know, or, or like, I think it was 2016, the incredible um, sort of way that the year finished where John Jones and Alex Gusterson fought. That was one month, I think, after after Pettis had submitted Ben Henderson in Milwaukee and no one even knew that the fight was over because he did it so quick. Um, and then after that, you had GSP fighting Johnny Hendricks and then GSP walked away from the sport. Like that was a year that stands out. Just like, oh my God, what a year. This year, great action, stuff that we will talk about and remember. But not sort of the higher peaks, I, I think, when you when you speak relatively. What what's kind of stood out to you in terms of, of the year and sort of like how it will be remembered, I guess. I definitely I definitely see what you're saying about maybe it wasn't the greatest year in MMA history. Uh, but it was it, it had its own charms about it. You know, I, I think and in some ways you could point to this year and say, well, that's why we watch. That's why we watch the sport. You know, that's why we watch MMA, because things are not a foregone conclusion. You know, things are. Things are constantly chaotic and, and they get thrown into upheaval. I mean, I mean, Brett, the year started, the first pay-per-view of the year, Francis Ngannou, the most dangerous puncher in the history of the sport, wins, uh, retains his title with his wrestling and grappling because he had a bum knee. I mean, that's how the year started. And then it just went, you know, crazier from there, from Oliveira losing the, the title on the on the scales to like we mentioned, you know, the Usman losing, Oliveira losing, Adesanya losing, Kayla Harrison losing. Nothing about this sport is predictable. And mm-hmm. that's, to me, one of the beautiful things about the sport is that we just don't know. We think we know, and we talk about it ad nauseum before these fights when we're on, you know, our, our preview shows, but no one really knows. And to me, that's that's a, that's a charm of the sport. Box office-wise, sure. pay-per-view-wise, whatever. But as far as, like, if you're an enjoyment, if you're an enjoyer of the sport as a fan, I think it was it, it this year had its moments for sure. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. It is funny when you I, like I think back about certain pockets of the year, though, and it was like like back to back main events that 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 ended in freak injury, you know, like Tom Aspinall yeah, and Brian Ortega. And then uh, a couple of months later, you had Calvin Cater and you're like, man, some of this, like this can't happen yeah. anymore, you know. Um, so it was a year in which even, but, even but, the uh, last pay-per-view of the year, Blagovich and uh, Uncle I have a uh, split draw, yeah. no champion crowned. I mean, yeah, it was very a, weird. It was a weird year. It was a weird year. I like the way you met, you put it, though, that it was a little charming, you know, and we had the two yeah. trips to London and that became like a really strong market. That's going to continue, yeah. obviously, with uh, the anticipated trilogy between Leon Edwards and Kamara Usman. So it set up a lot Paris of different stories. This year, too, first, yeah. first, uh, first UFC card in France. I was there. It was absolutely phenomenal. It was uh, the crowd was abs- just insane. And I, I'm looking forward to them going back there again next year. There's a lot of fans there. It was, you know, it was it was a charming year, Brett, a charming it year. Was- it was a charming year. And you are charming, Mark Ramondi. I hope that you found us charming on this 2022 recap and discussion. Go watch the 2023 look ahead, though, because I think as much fun it is looking back on the year, I do think it's a little bit more fun speculating and talking about what we're anticipating and what we're really excited to see in 2023. So stay tuned to the channel and uh, look for that one as well. And thanks for watching. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.